Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Varun Nakor, Executive Director of AAPI Progressive Action, and it's an honor and a privilege to present this, um, uh, open up this panel today. Uh, I want to welcome you all uh, to um, witness, frankly, um, uh, some insightful conversation in regards to AAPIs and COVID and what we, um, uh, I think, will soon sort of expect this coming fall when a, you know, a second wave potentially hits and, uh, you know, right around flu season. Um, of course, there is also some concern because the, um, the current administration has sort of fast-tracked a, um, a vaccine and we want to sort of cut through some of the noise uh, and, and um, you know, sort of dispel perhaps some, uh, some things that might be disinformation and, and uh, provide the best possible information from various subject matter areas to, to you all. So appreciate you being on today. I'm going to introduce our uh, panel and then hand it over to our moderator. Uh, first, we have Dr. Tung Nguyen. He's a primary care doctor in California and a healthcare researcher as well as the chair of API Progressive Action. Um, Dr. Lena Wynn is a, an emergency room doctor um, and uh, she was former uh, healthcare commissioner for Baltimore uh, uh, County and also is a public health uh, professor at George Washington University. Next, we have Louisa Blue, um, an ICU nurse and uh, at San, San Francisco General and Medical Center um, in the late 70s and early 80s, and also former clinical coordinator at Asian Health Services. And uh, we have Dr. Pratesh Gandhi. Uh, he's a primary care physician and associate chief medical officer of a community health care center. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Eric Fiegelding. He's an epidemiologist, health economist, and of course, one of the first folks in the United States to bring attention to the fact that COVID could go pandemic. And of course, here we are today. So with that, I'm very honored to uh, present uh, and introduce uh, Richard Louie, who I'm sure you all know, and uh, we're very uh, uh, honored to have him moderate today's panel. Varun, thank you. Uh, as a professional journalist, I will not be taking on uh, any political view, and I will ask questions uh, that will be down the middle and journalistic, uh, although I do appreciate the fact that we're gathering here on a topic that uh, really has no party, if you will. It's an issue of AAPIs during the pandemic. And so thank you so much, Varun, for inviting me. I look forward to this conversation. We will be taking questions and answers for those of you who have just logged in and are participating in this conversation. Thanks for being here. You can put your questions in Q&A. I will be monitoring that as well as the, the team and we will try to bring some of those questions forward to you. I'd like to go through uh, each of our guests today, and if you could uh, tell me what is the reality of the COVID-19 pandemic that we all need to focus on today, on the September 29th. What is the reality of the COVID-19 pandemic with an API perspective that we need to concentrate on today? And if you could limit your answers to one minute, that'd be fantastic. And for the expediency uh, of this conversation, I will be using first names because we have so many doctors here. So as you think about that, I'd like to bring in Tung, who's gonna give us an overview of some of the data around the question that I posed to our panelists. Uh, Tung, why don't you kick it off for us? Great, uh, thanks Richard, and thanks everyone for uh, attending this. Uh, I did want to ground us a little bit with some data on Asian American Pacific Islanders. Uh, it's not necessarily something that everyone's all up to date on. Uh, I would say that uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, it was reported that Asian American Pacific Islanders do not have COVID disparities. Uh, and that is what I think was distorted by the data problem with AAPI health, uh, which generally is either not collected at all, or they lump Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders together, or uh, and certainly there's very little data disaggregated by national origin groups like Chinese or Vietnamese or Filipino or by language. So that's just a general problem for API health. Uh, it wasn't about until two months of the epidemic when uh, uh, some researchers in San Francisco noted that half the deaths in San Francisco from COVID were Asian Americans. And that led to additional research that showed that 
the proportion of deaths to cases, which is sort of an indication of how, e how severe uh, the, the, the disease might be among Asian Americans was about two to three times higher than that of the overall population. And this was actually found in places uh, in like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City, New Jersey, Nevada, Massachusetts, uh, and a couple other states. Uh, and, and one potential explanation for this finding was that maybe Asian Americans weren't getting tested adequately in, in adequate numbers, uh, or that they were getting uh, poorer care, which led to higher deaths. Um, there's also been some data more recently, uh, both from survey data and also from the Kaiser Family Foundation, which looked at testing rates among about 50 million patients who are on the EPIC electronic health record, showing that Asian Americans were less likely to be tested for COVID than whites. Um, and then when they were tested in this particular sample, uh, they were about twice as likely to have a positive test compared to whites. Uh, for Pacific Islanders uh, in California, which is where really the, the best data are coming from, uh, they actually have the second or the highest or the second highest COVID-19 incidence rates uh, of any racial and ethnic group in nearly every county that report uh, NHPI data. Um, and so obviously we do not want to combine Asian American and Pacific Islander data uh, for this uh, one. This is one of the reasons why we don't want to do that. Uh, as far as deaths from COVID is concerned, a, a recent report from the APM Research Labs found that the death rates for Pacific Islanders nationally was about 71 deaths per 100,000, which is only lower than, uh, is lower only among Black and Indigenous Americans. And age-adjusted uh, data on this show that Pacific Islanders are about 2.9 times more likely to die from COVID than white Americans. Uh, and the same report found that Asian Americans were 1.3 times more likely to die from COVID than white Americans. Uh, and then I'll, I'll finish with the, the excess death rate, which is uh, uh, we compare the death rate from this year to prior years. Uh, the national excess death rate among Asian Americans in 2020 is 35% over prior years, uh, compared to only 9% for white Americans. Uh, in some of the states that we're focused on some, uh, these days, uh, in Florida, that, that excess death rate for Asian Americans is 34%, uh, in Texas, 31%, and in Georgia, 36%. In Pennsylvania, it's 51%, and uh, in New York and New Jersey, over 100%. So just to summarize, uh, uh, AAPIs uh, have risk of exposure to COVID because they are overrepresented among uh, healthcare workers and essential workers. They may not be getting tested for COVID adequately, and they die more from COVID than whites do possibly because of higher comorbidities, poverty, or poor access to quality health care. Thank you. Song, thank you so much for that. Uh, let's start with you, Lena. Lena, what is uh, one reality of the COVID-19 pandemic from an AAPI perspective that we need to focus on? Yeah, it's a great question and um, glad to join um, you, Richard, and, and all the panelists today. So I think there, this is something for APIs and I think for all of us to keep in mind as we are now going into month seven, month eight of this pandemic, which is that the virus itself has not changed. It may be that we're experiencing quarantine fatigue, which is very real. It may be that restrictions are being loosened all across the US, but the virus is just as contagious, just as deadly as it was before. And we're now seeing the data that it's not even so much in these formal settings that people are getting infected. At the beginning of the pandemic, it was these congregate settings and people have focused on how can we reduce infection rates, for example, in schools, in nursing homes, in these congregate settings. That remains very important. But I think where we are letting our guard down is with informal settings, gatherings with family, friends, our loved ones. Now, none of us want to think that our loved ones could be carrying coronavirus. And I know that no one would want to knowingly infect anyone else. But let's keep in mind that it's these informal settings that are now driving the pandemic. And so I would urge everyone to use an abundance of caution when we are interacting with loved ones too. The people who do not live in the same household as you, if you are gathering with them, make sure that you try to stay outdoors as much as possible. If you're going to be indoors, maintain at least a six foot distance, have everyone wear masks, even when indoors, if you're not with people in your same household. And a reminder too, that this is a good time for everyone to get their flu shot. We don't yet have a vaccine against coronavirus, but we do against the flu. And so before the end of October is the ideal time to get a flu shot so that we can best protect ourselves and our loved ones. 
And it takes time for that uh, flu shot to take effect. So you want to get it earlier, right, uh, Lena? And I just got mine, a little bit of pain right here, but it's still, I know it's working somehow inside my body. Pratesh, talk about uh, a reality of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, from an AEPI perspective. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's really nice to be on this panel with uh, everyone today. I'll tell you that a number of weeks ago, I saw a, a Vietnamese speaking family uh, in my clinic and uh, it was a really tough conversation. Uh, and uh, the patient was telling me that this was the first time that they had been out of the home since the start of the pandemic. Uh, and what I worry about uh, is that in communities that historically folks don't really focus on as perhaps being at risk uh, or underserved or disadvantaged, uh, there is a, a, a growing sense of isolation, uh, and I'm feeling that in real time. Often when I'm in uh, telemedicine clinics or when I'm in clinics seeing patients, uh, yes, we are seeing folks that have COVID symptoms. I was in our COVID clinic yesterday, but simultaneously, the mental health burden is growing. Uh, and I think that there, this undercurrent of isolation and loneliness is exacerbated, uh, is magnified, uh, in communities of color, uh, in families that speak a second language or don't speak English as a primary language. Um, and I think we got to pay attention to that. Uh, and I think it, it just, I think, underscores the importance of hammering yeah. home the need for a vaccine uh, and hammering home the need to take this pandemic seriously, because the faster we get out of this, uh, the yeah. faster we're able to deal with the mental health issues. Hey, hey Pratesh, what did you tell the family uh, and why is it magnified? Well, I mean, you know, for this family, we were able to do a couple of things. One, we were able to connect them um, with the local cultural uh, uh, house here in Austin uh, to be able to do outreach. Uh, two, we were able to connect them uh, to Meals on Wheels to be able to get them uh, adequate food. Um, but I think the third and perhaps the most important thing is to let them know that they're not alone uh, and that there is a social safety net uh, that is there for them. Uh, but I will not sugarcoat the very real challenge we have. I mean, our safety net, as I just spoke about, uh, while existing, uh, is riddled with holes. Uh, and I worry about our ability to keep track of the people that are uh, suffering from mental health uh, issues. Uh, this is a growing challenge and one that doesn't get enough focus, particularly uh, in the OPI world. It's tough. Louisa, uh, a reality, and you, you sort of, uh, we sort of hinted to that earlier in our conversation, right? From your perspective, what is one of the realities we need to focus on? I think one of the realities uh, that we definitely have to focus in on is that API workers uh, have a high percentage of being essential workers. Most people think of essential workers during this pandemic as healthcare workers, but there are so many industries where API workers uh, work in that expose them more to the COVID and also a lack of information that may be uh, not being given to them by their employers. So they're in the biomedical field, right? They're in the food service industry. They're in so many industries that are all considered essential workers. And so I hope that we'll be able to talk a little bit more about uh, what's needed. Right, yep. to try to address. Go ahead. That. What is needed, Louisa? Share that for us. Um, well, I, I think we need to elect the right uh, public officials coming in November who really believe in science, believe that this pandemic is going to get worse, and that everything that this country does to address this pandemic should be focused and based on scientific data. That's number one. Number two is getting the information out. And I hold employers responsible for that because we have seen early on this pandemic that hospitals were not providing PPEs for their employees, nursing homes where there's a large number of residents dying in nursing homes, but it's also because employers in the nursing home industry were not providing PPEs. When I see pictures of healthcare workers that have to wear garbage bags, you know, and makeshift masks because their employers are not providing it, that is morally wrong. If they're taking Thank care of patients, mm -hmm. they also have the equipment that they need. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, Eric, um, one of the realities that you're focusing on right now. Yeah, one of the realities is that the 
uh, as Fauci noted, this virus is way more transmissible as an airborne aerosol than we've ever recognized up until now. And the frustrating part was, you know, early in the pandemic, we were only talking about washing our hands, washing packages that arrives in the mail. But we totally ignored the fact that this virus is basically a virus of breathing and talking of not just six feet proximity, but any proximity indoors if you don't have ventilation. And, you know, in terms of the, from an API perspective is the Japanese actually knew about this and took aerosol airborne precautions from the very beginning. They assumed this virus is airborne from the beginning. And hence they focused on masking, obviously, falls of ventilation, also, you know, uh, air, air filtration and completely redoing the subways where also no one talks during subways and keep all windows down on subways. Like all these things where, had we just learned a little bit more from the Japanese and did more uh, just like the testing that the South Koreans did and heeded the warnings coming from China that this was very real. And, you know, even Trump, uh, according to Woodward's tape, uh, clearly recognized, oh, Bob, this is airborne. It's you breathe and you get it. Um, and he was advised based on, you know, his, his contacts in China. And had we just listened to the early science and look at how did the successful countries, you know, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, successfully uh, stop it, we could have avoided so much casualty and infection and grief in this. And so I think, you know, that's where the frustration is. We, we're six, seven months behind the rest of Asia in realizing that this virus is airborne. Um, Eric, when you look at the next quarter, as we finish up September here, the last quarter of the year, do you expect the thematic and the narrative to be the same? I think the thematic narrative, obviously a lot of things are under the water on the bridge. The virus has now escaped. It is uncontained in the US now. Um, and we never even flattened the curve. I think it's gonna get worse in, in terms of trajectory, with, especially in the winter time where there's more indoor activity. A lot of in the summertime, we could do a lot of things outdoors that we couldn't. And I think the other thing is we have to get around to the reality that PCR testing is not, not enough. And we can talk about that at a later time, but this, to in order for us to get to vaccines later we have to get through this winter and we have and this winter will be very very challenging tong um what is one of the realities you gave us some data here but outside of the data what's one of the realities that you're watching from an a perspective in COVID 19. yeah so um, obviously i agree with uh, uh, pretty much everything everyone has said i think as a public health uh, practitioner and, and researcher i think one of the key problem here is that uh, we're not able to reach, we don't have the resources or able to reach out to our communities the way we should with all of these messaging, right? So whether it's um, masking or testing or vaccinations, uh, we have not invested enough in, uh, in, in language or culturally appropriate uh, outreach uh, on all of these. Uh, so what we have now with our population is a group that's actually uh, just basically hold up in their house. We, we do we hear anecdotal evidence, people not leaving their home, so they don't get health care for anything else. Uh, they're very reluctant to do that. They're afraid of um, uh, obviously anti-Asian stigma from and, and, and racial bias uh, from, from the way that things are going in the public uh, domain right now. Uh, and then so, so even when we were to come up with really great ways of solving some of these problems, which we hope mm -hmm. we'll have in the next year or two, uh, our communities are still going to be behind on this uh, because we're not investing in it. Well, well Tong, uh, you mentioned vaccines earlier. Uh, that was brought up in our conversation so far. Um, of the couple of dozen that have had positive progress, what are we seeing? What are you watching? Yeah, well, I am not a vaccine researcher, so I'll, I'll maybe I'll leave it to the other experts. But I will tell you that the uptake of the vaccine is going to be a problem. So the, the the sort of the classic statement is vaccines don't prevent anything, vaccinations do. So even if you have a great vaccine and people are actually not uh, accepting it, that's a problem. And what we're hearing back is there's a lot of mistrust going on uh, for whatever reason, um, particularly in other communities. Uh, and of course, vaccinations work best when not just AAPIs get it, but uh, everyone gets it. 
Uh, there's a lot of mistrust and uptaking of the vaccine. Uh, and uh, I think with Asian Americans, they're a little bit more uh, enthusiastic, but even then, uh, they are still, we're hearing back that it's going to be problematic. So from my perspective, uh, while we're developing the effective vaccine, we're still going to also need a, a strategy to make sure the message gets out that when it does come, that we need to have communities uh, uptake it. Pratesh? Yeah, yeah, if I can add to that. I mean, I think so there's a, there's a couple of things here. First mm -hmm. of all, um, I think there's going to be a lot of debate around whether folks will trust the vaccine or not. Uh, now, I think the, one of the things that, that keeps me a little bit optimistic is that the oversight committees of the FDA, they, the folks that are on these uh, committees have been doing it for a long time. Uh, and I do have trust in the scientists that are part of that process. Uh, uh, and I think they know that if any part of this process is short-circuited, uh, we will never recover. I think there's a, there's a lot writing on that. Um, the, the second thing here is that when you invest in communities of color, uh, you can get the outcomes that are desired. And so the example I would give is that Recently, uh, we have invested heavily at our nonprofit health center in drive-through uh, flu vaccines. And I think there was this question, okay, um, will, and our, our population is uh, largely Spanish speaking, will a largely Spanish speaking population that perhaps has a historical distrust of some of the medical services here in the Austin area uh, come out for this kind of massive campaign? And the answer is every single day, all 35 slots of our drive-through vaccine clinic uh, are filled every day. Uh, and we've been doing this now for two and a half weeks straight. And so, you know, to me, the lesson learned there is, you know, let's not make the assumption that our communities aren't going to show up. You know, the answer is, uh, and I think to the point that was made, is that we've got to invest in culturally competent outreach strategies, because if we do so, our communities will show up uh, for appropriate care and treatment and services. Um, but we got to make the investment. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's what I'm seeing here on the ground. Louisa, uh, how, how are healthcare workers looking at therapeutics? How are they looking at a potential vaccine in terms of their day-to-day -day profession, right? They go to work. It's, it's mm -hmm. their shield, right? It's their guard. Mm -hmm. So I, I think within the medical profession, because they do get that information, hopefully they are getting that information, there's there's trust, right? Because they're working in the healthcare field. But for essential workers that are in the food industry, the delivery, del delivery uh, industry, postal workers, I'm not sure if they are getting that information. Now, if they're unionized, hopefully their union is providing them with that information. Uh, I used to work for the Service Employees International, was an international executive vice president. And because uh, we are the largest healthcare union in the country representing doctors, nurses, janitors, tech workers, we, we were serious about that. And we went to our healthcare member leaders and asked them what is needed, what do we have to do, right? They wanted to make sure they got the information that they also wanted us to fight politically at the federal, state, and local level and with the employers of the healthcare industry to hold them accountable. That we are taking care of sick patients, who is gonna take care of us in this pandemic? And you all are responsible to help make sure that we're also taken care of because we are getting exposed to the virus and we're probably bringing it home to our family members, right? And there's a responsibility. Get us the equipment that we need. And I'm beginning to hear another uptick in the healthcare industry that there still isn't enough PPEs for healthcare workers. That's not right, you know. Eric, um, efficacy and communities of color of these therapeutics and vaccines that are out there. Any considerations here? Yeah, I think, well, the efficacy, well, we still have to see what the results are in these trials. And I want to point out, rushing the trials uh, will actually uh, scare the, in terms of vaccine hesitancy. And, you know, you could actually win the short-term battle, but lose the war. Because if the efficacy, and initially, we want a vaccine that has at least 50% efficacy. Yeah, it probably will have that. Probably 60%, 70% and it will improve over time, or at least once all the different 
eight different phase three trials come, come out, we will see it. But uh, you know, if one, half the people, one third of the people don't take it, then a 60% efficacy vaccine becomes 30% uh, if it's half the people don't take it. And that, that's the concern. That effectively cuts the, uh, uh, any uh, vaccine uh, success in half. And the other thing is, in terms of testing uh, for the efficacy, we need to ha have enough inclusion of minorities, African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans, because oftentimes there's lots of genetic differences. And unless the vaccine trial is done in enough of these populations, we won't know the true efficacy in some of these populations. So a lot of these vaccine enrollment is so, so critically important. But ult ultimately, until we get to the vaccine, we have to have outreach enough to actually do enough testing. And the testing, I don't just mean PCR, but we need the rapid antigen test. And I think that's one of the highest priorities right now is rolling out the rapid antigen test so that everyone ha has access to fast, cheap, $1 inexpensive tests. That's how you truly end this epidemic until the vaccine. We're gonna get that. When are we gonna get that, Ark? And then to you, Lena. Yeah, to, to get that, we basically need mobilization. Well, FDA needs to approve more because right now they're only using this di strict clinical diagnostic criteria. You're not using the public health screening approach. And obviously, Lena can probably uh, answer more as a health commissioner, but the, the FDA right now needs to loosen it up and also approve way more. And so that more companies besides Abix, Benex now, which has entirely been bought up by the federal government for the rest of the year, it's available to the everyday so that we can have um, not just schools, but also every hotspot community can have unlimited access to these tests because that will truly end the epidemic. Lena? Yeah, I, I'm so glad to follow Eric in this because I completely agree. Having widespread, accessible, rapid testing will be a total game changer for us. I mean, I'm a mom of two kids and I know that I would feel much more assured um, about sending kids to school if I know that everyone can be tested in the morning prior to going to school. Testing is not the only solution here, but it certainly is a big part of the puzzle. And I just would want um, much more focus on this. I think so much has been focused on, for example, we just heard um, that the administration is putting out 150 million tests. Sounds like a lot of tests. But if we consider how many we actually need for everyone to be able to get regular testing, we're talking at least twice a week testing, 150 million tests might last us a week. Um, and so we really need a more coordinated effort on this. Just wanted to mention on the vaccine front too, that I think um, vaccine and therapeutics, there's a lot of progress being made as has been discussed, but we cannot be looking at the vaccine as a silver bullet. We need to be recognizing that for some time, for months, maybe years, we're going to be living with coronavirus in some way. And that's why investing in testing, focusing on all these other measures is going to be critical. One last point I'll make here is about the importance of trusting science. I know so many other people touched upon this too, but I think there has been um, something that I have, I did not think that I would see in my career, which is that the CDC, the FDA, these trusted scientific institutions, their credibility is now um, under attack not because of the work that they're doing. There are exceptional scientists working there, but because unfortunately their work has gotten politicized. And I think that's why we as physicians, as public health leaders, um, we need to be doing our part and as community members as well, to be doing our part to really emphasize the importance of science in driving this response. Isn't it strange, Lena, that, they're t that you as a doctor are talking about politics? Well, I want for politics to be removed from this entire conversation. I actually think it's not helpful when politicians, for example, are speculating on when a vaccine um, is going to be coming out because there are people who will look at that and think that the entire process of vaccine approval is getting politicized. Um, I think it's a major problem that something as basic as mask wearing has become a partisan symbol as opposed to a public health imperative. That's my view. Now, I, I think there are, is a need for, I know others can talk about this, for, um, for physicians to be involved in politics and advocacy. But for me as a physician, I think my voice and my role is on educating the public in a nonpartisan way. Got it. And, and I'm going to go around uh, the wheel here on that topic before we move on to some of our questions. By the way, thank you, Sunita, Elena, and others who are putting in questions in our Q&A. Uh, we're at halftime right now. 
uh, at the bottom of the hour. If you have any questions, go ahead to Q&A at the bottom of your browser uh, and type it in there and I'll, I'll be watching it. Make them good questions though. All right. Okay. So uh, let's go to the doctors here and, and talk quickly about when you're asked about politics and medicine, what's your answer? And this is strange, I know, for you medical doctors, because that's not what you do. I mean, we're all political beings, but when you're, when you're wearing the hat, right, you're wearing, when you're wearing the white coat, it's strange that you get asked this question. But what's the answer? Dr. Tung uh, first. Yeah, so, um, you know, we take care of our patients and we want the best to happen for them and for their family, because otherwise they'll be stressed or sick. Uh, and they don't live in the clinic and they don't just take pills. They, they live in the real world where all these things are happening and policies make a difference in terms of what they're exposed to, right. uh, what testing they're, they have available, uh, access to health care. I mean, the Affordable Care Act uh, it has really reduced the uninsured rates among Asian Americans, uh, particularly in states like even Texas and Florida. Uh, and right now, politically speaking, we're talking about, you know, uh, some group of people wanting to end the Affordable Care Act in the middle of a pandemic. You know, for, for us as a doctor, for me as a doctor to sit there and say, well, politics doesn't matter, is basically, you know, co condemning my patients, particularly those who have poor health care access, mm. uh, to a, an untenable situation. So I, in order for me to just take care of them, I would need to write prescription, I need to do tests, but I also need to make sure that they have access to all the, the things that they need for help. Not an easy uh, uh, question to answer, certainly. Dr. Patesh, what do you say? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm biased, right? I, I just uh, finished running an 18 month race for the US Congress. And so uh, the, the, what drove me into that race was this idea that for those of us here in medicine, we take an oath to do no harm. Uh, and when we look at the slate of policies uh, or changes to policy that are being proposed, uh, by folks in power right now in Washington, those policies directly harm the communities and patients that we serve. And so then therefore we have an obligation to speak out. Being political in and of itself is not a negative thing. Being partisan is, and there is a distinction there. Being political means fighting for uh, the rights and fighting for the empowerment of the communities we serve. That's a part of the democratic process. That's what our country is founded on. Uh, but it's different than being partisan. And so I think we have this, op this obligation and responsibility. When I'm in clinic and I'm seeing patients of mine that live in a certain zip code, and I know that if they go across the highway to a different zip code, their life expectancy likely increases by 10 years. When I was in training, uh, I worked at a clinic where if you were a black man, you had a 30 year life expectancy difference. And if you were a white man a few miles up the road, zip code shouldn't affect the life expectancy of the patients that we serve. Therefore, it's an obligation to get involved in the policy decisions and in the political process because it directly affects the health and well-being of the communities we serve. Dr. Eric, you got the white coat on. What do you say? Well, I, I don't always wear the white coats. And I actually agree with Patesha. Um, you know, as, a, as someone who also ran for Congress uh, a few years ago, before people knew what the meaning of epidemiology is, um, I think he, we have to think of it, public health is policies, right? But by definition, public health is by, defined by health policy, and health policy is politics. You can't, you know, as much as we want to separate them as, you know, science completely separate of policy, you can't because uh, the, in, the very nature of health policy is political. So I think as, as scientists, as Asian doctors, oftentimes um, you know, we're often told to stay in our lane, right? Just see patients, you know, don't, don't go beyond um, what your day job is, uh, seeing patients or doing your research. And I think this, this also gets at the glass ceiling uh, issue. I think we have to be outspoken and we have to advocate and advocate more than just the whimper as many healthcare workers uh, have the capacity to. We actually have to lean into the policies and the politics of this because holding political leaders accountable so that they don't dilute, muzzle, censor science, public health science actually saves lives is so critical for us healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. And people not wearing masks and causing outbreaks at Brigham Women's Hospital just this past week. Brigham Women's Hospital had over a dozen 
uh, cases of p patients coming in not wearing enough masks and then the doctors w um, getting infected. Um, and I think that's just part, fundamentally highlights this, we cannot live in this vacuum that public health is policy, is politics, and all healthcare workers should lean in. Well, I think Louisa, uh, just by counting the number of nods of her head, uh, uh, 32, I think, uh, while, you, while all of you were speaking, <laughs> would agree. Uh, Louisa, what are frontline essential workers doing to become political or not? What, what are you seeing? Are they stepping up? Or are they stepping back? I think they are stepping up, but so much more can be done. Right, because people don't like to and talk I mean about politics. Right, I mean politically. You, I, right? I, yeah, mean politically. I know they're stepping yeah. up to work and to to, to, to protect also, us Americans. Right. Yeah, politically also they're they're stepping up to that. So there are a number of forums that are being organized by Asian Pacific Islander political groups. I'd like to say or civic engagement groups that is focused on exactly this and why our voices matter. And let me give you an example. So I used to be a registered nurse way back when, but mm. I was working at San Francisco General at the mm. very beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic before the virus was discovered. And so mm -hmm. because the information wasn't getting out, workers were, you know, they were afraid. They didn't know anything about it. And so as president of the union then at San Francisco General, I asked for a meeting with the administrators. And it's like, here's what's happening. Walk the floors. AIDS patients are not getting their meal trays. You have doctors that are telling other physicians and other nurses and other healthcare workers at San Francisco General, you have the right not to provide care. That is wrong. And because we're also a political organization, and what I always say is, as healthcare workers, we have to be advocates for our patients. And that means we get involved politically because we have to hold elected officials accountable, health departments accountable, and that's what's needed. We have to be advocates and we should always remember that. Um, with the anti-Asian backlash that's happening now, right? Um, it's even more important that we get involved politically because as the previous uh, doctor talked about, Policy is politics, and we have to be advocates. And I truly believe in that. It was not a good experience back there in the early 80s where my union had to fight to make sure that healthcare workers were getting educated and that as healthcare professionals, it is our obligation to provide compassionate care to anybody that walks into that hospital. But it was a well, fight to get it done, it was, you know? It, and so two part question to you know, two part comment uh, to mm -hmm. you, Louisa. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, if you represent the healthcare workers, well, actually, everybody in this panel does, but you speaking for healthcare workers in hospitals, uh, I got to see many of them at the beginning of the pandemic up close and personal as my father uh, was in the hospital in San Francisco. Uh, and many of them, uh, these descriptions that we're all talking about, uh, I saw them. And they, they came in to help my father. They didn't know whether, you know, he had all the symptoms of COVID at the time, uh, but he didn't test positive at the time. Um, so thank you. And I want to go on to a, another point since you brought up San Francisco General and you being an RN during the HIV AIDS outbreak and pandemic, uh, 5B uh, was certainly mm -hmm. emblematic of courage in healthcare workers. What did you learn at San Francisco General from 5B that we need to remember today, since you were at SF General at that time? Yeah, so 5B was right outside of the ICU that I worked with. So we worked very closely uh, sure. with the 5B nurses, but it really took a lot of discussion. And, and, and characterize what 5B was in two sentences, by the way. Uh, yeah, it was the AIDS ward. It was specifically for AIDS patients and only nurses and other healthcare workers at the hospital who volunteered to work on 5B were asked to come. So all of those folks volunteered. Yes, I can they work. They stepped up. They yep. stepped up. And they continued to meet with elected officials in terms of what was needed. Because at that time, we were also getting patients outside of 
the city and county of San Francisco. I remember taking care of a patient from San Luis Obispo and he couldn't get the care there. An ER doc gave him an oxygen tank and said, drive up to San Francisco General Hospital. That shouldn't have happened. It should not have happened. He should have been able to get the care that he needed there. Instead of driving up, whatever it is, six hours, oxygen tank is empty, and he ended up dying a couple of weeks later, right? And um, that I will never forget, that there was actually a healthcare provider that said, here, here's an oxygen tank, go up there, because we can't provide you the care, when they could have. It's a phone call away, right? Um, so now with this you know, pandemic, that's not going to go away soon. It's really important um, for us to continue drumming, you know, hitting the drumbeat on how important this is and that people should uh, hold their elected officials accountable. I mean, look what, look what the administration has done. They haven't done anything, right? And it's been healthcare workers, right, at the forefront that has been fighting for PPEs and other needs for healthcare workers. So I worry about the other workers, you know, yeah. who work in Amazon. I don't know what kind of, you know, I have no idea whether they're getting the PPEs that they need or the education that they need to protect themselves. I think it's spotty, but it's not, you know, completely across the country where all the Amazon sites are getting the education that they need and the protective gear, right? Thank you, Louisa. And, and now we're going to move into some of the questions that have been asked in the Q&A section. Uh, but before we go there, I mean, this was certainly a time that I, and I'm, I'm no, not uh, a doctor and have no medical training, but I've now read the Hippocratic Oath probably about 10 times uh, in the last six months. And uh, anybody out there, if you haven't read it, go read it now so you understand what the folks are that we have in front of you here have committed their lives to uh, and committed their their purpose to. All right, so I'm just gonna, for all the panelists, if you want to answer the question, just unmute yourself or raise your hand or just talk. This is, uh, just don't argue. Uh, well, you can argue if you want. And keep your answers as quick if you can, uh, because I wanna get to as many of these as we are able to. Um, when we look at education uh, is the question, what does this mean for our educators? What does this mean for our children? How do we talk about it in the AAPI community? Lena, I, I'm going to go to you qu quickly because you said you have two children. Yeah, I do. So I, I have a baby <laughs> who is five months old and I have a three-year-old. But I also, in my previous role as the health commissioner for the city of Baltimore, um, I also oversaw school health. Um, and so the issue of schools and, and educational disparities that we're now seeing with COVID is something that I very much am aware of. And I think, um, you know, just speaking on, on that for a moment, this is such a difficult topic because on the one hand, we know that in-person schooling is critical, that we are widening our educational disparities many fold. We're not taking into account food and mental health reasons and so many reasons why students need to be there for in-person instruction. And um, there is a real need for us to focus on those who are the most vulnerable and to get people back. But on the other hand, um, you know, I also come, come to this as the daughter of a school teacher. My, my mother was a longtime school teacher in Los Angeles who had breast mm. cancer. She died from breast cancer, but um, she was undergoing chemotherapy for eight years and radiation for eight years while being a school teacher um, in, in LA. And I think about all the teachers who want to be back, but who need to have protection for their health um, as well. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, this is not something that can exist in a vacuum. We can't look at schools as, oh, let's get people back in schools without thinking about what's happening in the communities around us. If there is widespread community surge, we can't keep schools safe. And so ultimately we as a society have to decide what are those things that are the most important. If schools are the most important, then we have to be making trade-offs in other ways and saying, what are those other places that are less essential? Right. That, um, that, that, that we may want to close in the meantime. I knew there was a reason why you were a good egg, Lena. My mom also taught in the LA school district. So uh, you're, you're, you're okay in my book, books. Uh, Sunita's asking this. She's saying, uh, are we also behind the rest of the world in terms of contact tracing? Are we also behind, who wants to talk to that? I'll talk. Um, in, in terms of contact tracing, 
especially compared to Korea and many other countries where, let's be honest, Korea has a very you know, you know, surveillance friendly society and people are very willing to be surveilled in the name of um, safety and security. And compared to that and many other countries that have really good adoption of contact tracing apps like Singapore in, in addition to Korea, we are really behind. People basically in the US, if you try to call up someone half the time it's spam calls and people don't pick up and people don't want to report accurately. In, in China, by the way, when they did a contact tracing, they didn't trust whether you went to Wuhan. They basically took out your SIM card and traced, did your SIM card ever attack, uh, touch one of the cell phone towers in Wuhan? But we don't have that kind of invasiveness here. And even when the Northeast states like Cuomo put in a rule that anyone coming from Florida must quarantine, we have no way to trace that or enforce that other than if someone fl flew into uh, JFK airport. And so it, in the US, we're so behind on that. And uh, this gets to a, a matter of social trust. And in many Asian countries, there is a social trust that, uh, you know, a good well-functioning state has, you know, yeah. let's leave out its China side, but I think, you know, Singapore, Taiwan, and Korea have that, but we, we unfortunately do not, and we don't have the capacity to. So we just kind of- Dr. Eric, quickly. Things. Yeah, Dr. Eric, quickly here, which state in the United States is doing the best here, quickly? Oh, that's hard to say, but I would say the Northeast states, the um, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Maryland, they're all doing pretty well. And Virginia actually has a, a Apple iPhone integrated uh, location track contact tracing system. It's the only state that has it. But again, it's a, it's a matter of resources. Not every state has the same resources. Got it. Great, great, great. Uh, uh, Elena asks this, uh, COVID could be considered a pre-existing condition in America that does not have the ACA. Opinion? It's, it's a huge risk. Uh, one week after the general uh, election, the Supreme Court will start to hear arguments uh, on this ACA case. Uh, 20 million Americans uh, could lose their health insurance. Uh, the stakes could not be higher. And I don't mean, this is not hyperbole here. I mean, the reality is I, I practice medicine in a state that has the highest number of uninsured individuals in the nation, state of Texas. Uh, on top of that, uh, the ACA has been under attack for the last decade, uh, and now the Supreme Court will start to hear these cases. Uh, if this ends up in a 4-4 four four tie, uh, or if there's a new justice on the court by then, uh, this will have ra ramifications throughout. And so I, I, I think that, you know, to the second part of this uh, question, how can people take action? Uh, look, I, I'm not going to tell you how to vote uh, or, or what to support, but I'll tell you that if you care about uh, health insurance and you care about the uninsured and the underinsured in our country, uh, then you ought to be active on phone banks uh, and on registering people to vote. Now's the time. So uh, this question is from uh, Mr. Audrey or Ms. Audrey. Uh, the question is this, diverse testing in communities of color is hampered by lack of staff who can speak in language uh, for consent and to ensure understanding of the process. React to that, uh, uh, Dr. Tung or Louisa. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, there are very few uh, institutions that actually has the diversity in terms of culture and language that are needed for to work in, in API populations in particular. So it's it absolutely necessary for whichever agency it is to collaborate with community organizations. Uh, community organization uh, are in the community, they know their needs, they have the resources to do the outreach. Uh, and so we need to not just put more money into things, we need to put more money into the right places, including our community organizations. Louisa? Yeah, and I would say, um, at least within the Service Employees International Union, we use yeah. a lot of social media, right? But uh -huh. we also made sure that we had to translate uh, the informational materials on COVID-19, right? right? And and we work with our community allies because when you translate from an Asian language to English, right. there's something lost in the translation. Or it PPE, quite, for instance, yeah, like how right. do you say that, right? It doesn't uh -huh. quite translate well, but we really depended on our community allies. Here's what we have down in Vietnamese. Does this make any sense to you? Help yeah. us change it, right? Because it's yeah. way over the top. Same thing within you know, the Filipino community in Tagalog, even though we're 
proficient, you know, proficient in English, we still speak Tagalog at home, right? And so we need to make sure that we have those bilingual uh, pamphlets and that we work with our community allies, right? That was your fist sure. hitting the table there, right, Louisa, to yeah. really bring home the point. Uh, yeah. I, want, I want to get Pratesh, Dr. Pratesh and Dr. Lena's uh, reaction to that point. Because as we have said, and we know, and it's been in the news, and we've talked about it many different, for many different communities, um, this pandemic has exposed gaps and increased them, whatever gaps existed. Uh, one of the gaps is certainly in language for the AAPI community, whether you're talking about politics, policy, uh, community work, writ large for the AAPI community, because we have 50 origin countries plus, and who knows how many hundreds of dialects and languages being spoken. This is tough stuff. Uh, Dr. Lena, quickly on that. Yeah, um, one of the um, um, core principles of public health is the idea of the trusted messenger, that you need people who are from the communities that they serve um, in order to do the work. Um, and so I think there is an opportunity for us actually within public health to think about what we want our system to be like moving forward. And so the mm -hmm. idea of hiring community health workers to do testing, contact tracing, ideally these individuals can also receive training for the long term. And right. we can recognize that so much of our of how we got to where we are is because of an inadequate public health infrastructure. And perhaps there is a way for us to continue um, promoting these co community health workers for the long term yeah. as part of our system too. Dr. Pratesh, uh, in your clinic, uh, what is the word uh, regarding COVID that you learned in the last four months you, in, in another language you thought you would never learn? Uh, the word, <laughs> that's a really good question. Uh, peligroso, uh, which means dangerous. I mean, I think that that's the, that's the one word that we talk about regularly. Uh, and I think to Lena's point, uh, you know, the language matters so much because the gateway to literacy is through language, right? Like we can't expect people to make decisions for themselves to keep their themselves safe and their families safe, to make the right decisions on vaccines, to make informed right. decisions if health literacy isn't a part of the conversation. So Dr. Dr. Bertesh, I'm, yeah. I'm interested, what is that that you're using with patients in the clinic when they can't understand what you're saying, when peligroso doesn't work? What, yeah, do I mean, you have so, signs? Do you point? Yeah. What, are you, what are you doing? All, all of them. So uh, most of us speak a second language. For us, our patient population is mostly Spanish. I speak Spanish. Most of the staff, almost all of our uh, cl uh, clinical staff does. And so we're able to talk in that language. But on top of it, we've got handouts and figures and other, other graphics that we can give. But it's just not enough. I mean, the patients that we serve, yes, overwhelmingly Spanish, but I've got Nepali patients and Vietnamese speaking space patients, and we don't have those resources because quite frankly, I mean, let's just cut through it here. Uh, we don't have the money, okay? Uh, FQHCs, health centers, nonprofit uh, centers, nonprofit hospitals, uh, safety net centers across our country, we provide the backbone of care for the uninsured and underinsured, and we are unfunded, have been unfunded. And okay. if we don't address that issue, we don't, we don't have the money. We don't have the money how much, to develop how, those programs. How much money do you need for your clinic? And how, what's the budget of the clinic right now? Like, yeah, I mean, so a, a clinic like ours, which has about 18,000 unique patients and I don't know, we do about 100,000 encounters. I think our budget's roughly around 30 million, somewhere in that range per year. Uh, but it, it, it doesn't even come close, right? We're talking we about in the middle 60? of a pan. Go ahead. You need 60 million? What do you need? You know, I, the question is, what kind of care do we want to provide for our patients? Yeah. Right, yeah. like, do, where, where do we want the savings to come? If we care about providing wraparound services for our patients so that they can enroll, you know, in in help for food and help to find a sure. job, then yes, fund the the health centers that are medical homes, uh, and so you we'll need, need double that amount. You need double, okay? Just because folks yeah. like myself who don't know, you know, yeah, I, some context, hundred, triple, or double, or you are, know, that's, that's why we are profoundly limited by the budgets that we have uh, because okay. of the state of reimbursement in our country. Okay, so I'm down to like five minutes, and I want to get to 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 this next question, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Eric. Talk about PPE. Uh, we're, anonymous attendee has brought up that issue of shortage. Uh, and I know mm. that you were had a flurry of, of uh, tweets uh, today about that very topic. You're known for flurries. 
Um, so the PPE is just extremely frustrating. We should have, could have, would have had way more protection for us uh, if only we in induced DPA, the Defense Production Act. And the fact that we failed to do or order any PPEs until mid-March is an epic failure on the U.S. part because our strategic reserve quickly ran out within a few weeks. Uh, but PPEs right now, we, we're like six months after March, and we are still still suffering shortages of M95 uh, PPEs, respirators. And right now, a lot of hospitals are now resorting to KN95. But the problem is, uh, according to the latest study, um, 70, 60, 70 percent of KN95s imported from China are actually are not at filtration grade of a KN95. And that's really frustrating because that endangers our healthcare workers. And at the yeah. same time, you know, all this could have been prevented if only we activated DPA, Defense Production Act, for PPEs instead of burgers and sausages as they are currently right now. Um, so I think this is one of those uh, ongoing things that and other doctors can probably comment this ongoing shortage is really endangering. What's the difference with the K in front? The, K, the KN95 is like this equivalent. The FDA has also approved. It's, it's not the exact same, the round one. It's, it's these uh, secondary filtration. It does not right. have, allow as much pressure, but it supposedly has as much filtration, but it's very easily uh, uh, forged into these fake ones that are being yeah. now sold online. And it's very frustrating. May, maybe Dr. Ram yeah. Pitesh can comment. There, there are great KN95s and there are just awful one. So we're lucky yeah. that the Medical Society here in Travis County does testing to test mm. every kind of PPE that we get because we're all sourcing these on our own. Uh, and we've had some KN95s that have tested at like 27% uh, as opposed to like 97 or 98%, Holy Hannah. which is where you want. Yeah. Yep. No. Where are they from? Uh, all over. Uh, I mean, the ones that, that oh, we no. get are, are, no. are from China, um, but all, all over. Okay. Uh, Dr. Tong, I think you wanted to say something? Uh, no, I'm fine. Thanks. Oh, okay. Just want to say hello to you then, Dr. Tong. Uh, uh, Alina, any thought on, on, on masks and PPE? You know, only to say that, I mean, I certainly agree that we need a lot more. And I actually really can't believe that we're in this position now. Because one might say back in February and March, maybe that we couldn't see it coming. And that this was a once in a lifetime kind of pandemic. But now we know, and I still cannot believe that we're in the position that we are. I mean, how can we expect our healthcare workers to take care of patients if we are sending them into harm's way without the necessary mm -hmm. equipment to care for, for, for themselves? And I think at this point, we really need to follow the science, follow the data, understand that this is a matter of protecting the public. And we now know what it takes. We just need the political will to do it. And I Big think we need up. it for all health, not just healthcare workers, but we need mass production for everyone. Premium masks, at least minimum surgical masks for every man, woman, and child, and then mail to them. But we're not even close to that right now, unfortunately. I, I'm going to finish with Sandeep's uh, question. Big wind up, big floating ball here for all of you to hit at. And who has the better health care plan for America? Dr. Tung, we'll start with you. Uh, well, there's only one person with a health care plan for America. The other person doesn't actually have a plan. We keep getting promises that things will get better, but that's not a plan. Uh, uh, one of the candidates, uh, the Democratic candidate, has laid out a very comprehensive health care plan. Um, and so uh, you, know, you can look at it and criticize it, but I think uh, the other candidate basically wants to take away uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, does not want to coordinate any national effort in, in producing PPEs and in, in sort of uh, encouraging people to wear masks. Uh, so I just feel like it's uh, it's pretty much a you know it's, it's hard to criticize a plan that doesn't exist. For those who have looked at both uh, candidates and their stances on healthcare and their plans, either stated or not stated. Um, Please bring up a point also in what you've read and what you've seen in what they have put out publicly that is standing out to you, in addition to answering my question about who has the better plan. And again, we're closing shop here. So if you keep your answers to 60 seconds, that'd be great. So since your mic is on, Dr. Eric, let's go with you. Yeah, I think uh, 
Joe Biden's plan for universal masking is really, really critical because, you know, until we have a vaccine and widely distributed and adopted, we need to mask and we cannot avoid masking for a long, long time. And especially as we enter the winter, especially as Florida and Ron DeSantis is actually reopening restaurants and bars and nullifying all mask mandates so that they cannot be enforced. This is just gonna put us in a terrible, terrible path towards a brush fire that will burn out of control, akin to what's happening on the West Coast, but for COVID in many of these anti-mask states that, you know, run not just Florida, but also Georgia, also Nebraska, these, and I think you need federal leadership on this point and Joe Biden's plan for national mask mandates and funding to support schools in this area is so critical. Louisa? I, I think I have anything to add to what has been mm -hmm. said, but I would like to say in terms of our Democratic uh, nominee that he has reached out at least to SEIU healthcare workers virtually and just listen to their stories about what they face. And then our international president, Mary Kay Henry, is part of his healthcare advisory team and providing him input, right, with how healthcare can be so much better and what his plan should have. He's taken some suggestions, some suggestions he hasn't, but he really does, Biden really does have a much better handle on what healthcare needs to be in this country, especially at a time of pandemic. And um, the image that sticks with me is when they had the, um, the Trump supporters, you know, blocking entrances to the hospital with their guns and rifles of healthcare workers who are trying to get into the hospital to take care of patients. And they're out there protesting because of the mandatory wearing of masks. And then we saw healthcare providers in some city, I can't remember which, uh, where they knew that the Trump supporters were gonna come and demonstrate again against wearing a mask. And we had nurses in their uniforms and their masks and doctors standing in front of those protest cars because they were not gonna, they were not gonna have that. You're not gonna block us from doing what we need to do. And we are gonna educate people and we're gonna wear masks, do social distancing, hand washing, right? And that's why I keep going back to, we are advocates of the community and we have to take a stand. And November is gonna be very critical, very critical. Right. And then the only other thing is, if we have the p political influence at the state level, that we work with our state elected officials, similar to what we've been able to do with Governor Newsom in California, to be able to implement changes that would make it safer right. for healthcare workers mm -hmm. and essential workers to do their jobs. Thank you, Louisa. Dr. Lena. Only one thing, which is that it is so critical for all of our candidates to be standing behind our scientists instead of pushing them under the bus. Um, this is a time when we need for public health to be leading. Um, and I mean, this is a public health crisis. We need public health to be at the forefront and science and data and trust in public health should not be undermined. And so I would look to any of our candidates, again, speaking in a nonpartisan manner um, for me, but um, I would look to all of our candidates to see who is going to put public health front and center and support science rather than undermine it. And I'm afraid that I am going to have to leave, but just have so appreciated this conversation. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lena. And Dr. Pratesh, 30 seconds to you. Yeah, look, I've got my scrubs on. I'm about to head over uh, to uh, clinic right after this. Um, I'm not naive enough to believe that we can live in a nation without suffering. I understand that suffering is a, a part of the human condition, uh, but preventable suffering isn't. Uh, and seeing children in one of the biggest states in the country suffer because they don't have access to health insurance and because uh, of a inability to plan appropriately for this pandemic is unacceptable to me. There is one candidate that has put out a plan uh, for our nation in terms of coverage of uninsured individuals and one candidate that has put out a science-based, evidence-driven plan to deal with this pandemic. His name is Joe Biden, uh, and, uh, and he's going to win this November. All righty.
Well, that hour went by pretty quickly, and I am honored to speak to uh, all five of you. Lena, uh, if you're on TV somewhere, thank you for, for also joining us today. Thank you, all five. Uh, it really was informative uh, to understand what are some of the, the realities for the AAPI community and what we have, have to look forward to uh, in the next uh, quarter as the way we started. There's a concern, obviously, of COVID-19 for the AAPI community and all the issues we discussed right now alongside the election. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tung. Thank you so much, Dr. Pratesh, Dr. Eric, Louisa, Dr. Lena. Thank you all for being here and being part of this conversation, whether you have dialed in via Facebook or dialed in via Zoom. We appreciate your time. Uh, continue the conversation. Let's keep on going. For now, we'll, we'll see you and appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.